Now there was nothing to do but wait for rescue. Among those standing on the upturned boat was Harold Bride, the wireless operator, who confirmed to his companions that the Carpathia was on her way. At 3.30 a.m., she was sighted on the horizon, firing rockets. And at 4.30, she was on the sea. The Carpathia arrived with the dawn, and by 8.30 had taken on board 705 survivors and 14 lifeboats, the rest being set adrift. And uh, we were picked up, as you know, in the morning by this little ship, the Carpathia. And the rescue uh, of people from lifeboats in mid-ocean is quite a terrifying thing. These little boats, shall we say, draw up alongside, for want of a better expression, to what looks like an enormous vessel. She was quite a small vessel, the, Car the Carpathia, but she looked big from there. And then how do you get on board? You don't have a gangplank like you do when you're ashore. And so they opened a, a, a sort of, I don't know whether the word is right, a hatch in the side of the ship where the luggage used to be laid. And um, they threw down rope ladders and people like my mother and other grown-ups had to climb up in mid-ocean up a swaying rope ladder, rope ladder, which she said was the most terrifying thing. A sailor behind sort of holding on. And then uh, what could the children do? We couldn't climb up a rope ladder. So they got these big luggage nets and the mesh is very wide apart. It's quite a big mesh. Children would have slipped through it, small children. Anyway, our legs and feet would have gone through. So each child was put in a sack. And I remember being petrified when I was put in that sack and it was tied around and the sack full of these children were put into these huge nets and quite safely, of course, hauled aboard. But that really was quite terrifying. Then having got on board, of course, I couldn't find my mother. And I didn't find her for hours, but eventually I found her. And I'm quite sure one of the most pathetic things must have been the whole of the next day, how these poor women, such as my mother, my mother roamed about the ship looking to see if they could see the husband they left behind. But no one found anyone. En route to New York, Captain Rostron only allowed official and personal messages to be sent from the ship by radio. Newspapers, thus denied hard copy, made up their own fanciful accounts of the disaster. It was only on arrival that the true story became known and gradually the dreadful news of the disaster was released to the world. Memorial services were held on both sides of the Atlantic, while the crew were detained under virtual arrest until the official inquiries were carried out, their pay having been stopped from the moment of sinking. Controversy reigned over who was to blame and whether the nearby ship, the Californian, could indeed have rescued everyone on board if only her wireless operator hadn't closed down his set 20 minutes before the collision with the iceberg. The lookouts certainly saw and counted the rockets but thought these might have been company signals used for identification purposes on ships still not fitted with radio and they also appeared to be too low for a ship reportedly so near. The American inquiry placed blame for the disaster on J. Bruce Ismay, the fact that the Titanic was sailing at virtually full speed, 21 knots at the time of collision, knowing there were icebergs in the area, and the lack of sufficient lifeboats. The English inquiry also blamed the speed and inadequate provision of lifeboats, but also cited Captain Smith. After this tragedy, ships were to travel on a more southerly Atlantic route, travelled slower and always had lifeboat provision for all on board. 63% of the Titanic's first-class passengers survived, 42% of second-class and 25% of third-class. 23% of the crew were saved. 
705 in all, leaving 1,500 to perish in the icy seas of the North Atlantic. But the press of the day concentrated not so much on the loss of life and who was to blame, but on how British and American values of heroism, honor, and courage had been upheld throughout the tragedy. Men behaved as men should do. All heroes, every one. And on Captain Smith's reputed last words, be British. Was the cry as the ship went down. Every man was heavy at his post. Captain and crew, when they knew the war. For over 70 years, the Titanic lay undiscovered in the depths of the Atlantic. There were fanciful ideas that she would still be intact, that corrosion would be minimal as she was at such a great depth, that she could be refloated. On September the 1st, 1985, the American naval research vessel Knorr from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution discovered her. The Titanic had been found after 73 years. The scientist in charge was Dr. Ballard, and many fascinating photographs and video pictures were taken on this and a subsequent visit to the site in July 1986. The liner is broken into two main sections, but sits upright with her funnels gone. She is severed just aft of her second funnel, and the stern section is 800 meters away. Much of the central section lies in shattered segments on the seabed. A silver memorial plaque has been left on the wreck as a mark of respect and to honor her as an official grave to the hundreds who perished with her, and as a tribute to a disaster which should never have happened. I entirely agree with my dear Dr. Ballard's words. He said the whole thing was a tribute to man's arrogance, and I agree with that. The man can be so arrogant as to build something and claim that it is undestroyable, if you like. This is the most arrogant thing to say. True, if the Titanic had struck rocks or a tempest and storm and sunk, that would be one thing, but this was a ship that needn't have had any loss of lives. That, I think, is the most dreadful part of it. And as I say, all these years later, this interest is profound. And it's because there was no one need for anyone to die. No one should have died. Had she had enough lifeboats with two and a half hours and a very smooth sea, nobody would have died. And one life is worth more than the whole ship, surely. That is what I saw, that is what I remember. And there are hardly any of us now to share this memory, of course. I'm the only living survivor now that can remember it and um, get about, so to speak. I don't think it's anyone that can really tell the whole story of it, except myself. Later tonight, right aboard the Navy's newest and most powerful submarine when KPBS brings you the Nova Science Series airing at 11. And next at 9, National Geographic continues a remarkable profile of everyday life in Lijiang, China. That's just ahead on KPBS. <laughs>